you're on it, sir. <laughs> anyway, it's very nice to meet you again. And uh, thank you very much for giving us this time. Sure, my pleasure. And we have a whole room full of people eager to meet you. Are there any particular expectations? <laughs> oh. Okay, so the first person is Indira, who you know well. She's Indira. been reading. She's been reading your book. Oh goodness me! <laughs> In fact, a few people have been reading it. Hi there. How are you doing? Hi, Andrew. <laughs> wow, nice, nice to, to see you. Nice to see you again. Mm. <laughs> Yes, I, I read bits of your book. I didn't read it all. I was very touched from the, I don't know how you call it, prologue or something from the... Prologue. Prologue, yes. Prologue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I found it really, really touching, really touching. Yeah, very, very powerful, very powerful. Well, it's quite a story. Yes. And I'm glad that part of it is over. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a question about um, this collective enlightenment. Yeah, you write in the book about it. So and in the book, you write something um, that especially there were certain groups. It seems like you describe it like certain groups working on it. And especially you talk about a man group with, I don't know, 30 or 40 people. Yes. And maybe you can talk a bit about, I was wondering, what did you do in this group? And how did you, how you, how you describe it? It sounds a bit like that there is a sort of goal and you had the feeling you come closer to the goal. And I was wondering, how did you, how did you know this? Or how did you, I mean, measure the improvement or well, what happened was, I think in the, my first year of teaching, at a certain point, I was in Amsterdam, and the, a lot of people were coming to see me. So uh, at one point, a group of people who were coming to see me every night invited me for lunch. And then after lunch, I was sitting by myself, and I was looking at a, a man and a woman who were having a conversation. And it became obvious to me that, that, they, were, that they were sharing a higher state of consciousness together. Mm -hmm. And I realized, and I realized the fact that they could share this state had enorm I, I felt had enormous implications for the evolution of consciousness because usually the awakening to enlightened awareness is an inner subjective experience that occurs within the consciousness of a unique individual. I have my inner experience of uh, I have my inner subjective experience of non-duality. You have your inner private subjective experience of non-duality. But I realized that this non-dual space was becoming the shared ground between them. And I thought, wow, if human beings could meet in the shared space of intersubjective non-duality, what could this mean about the evolution of consciousness, about the evolution of our species? So I became very interested in the enormous potential of when enlightenment or the experience of enlightened awareness was not just a subjective experience within of a unique individual, but became the shared intersubjective space between us, the ground upon which we meet. So this was my, this became my goal. And um, I noticed, I, I, I started noticing all kinds of things that I noticed that, um, that when I would spend time with my male students and I would spend, spend out some time together, just like, like, like as men in a sauna or having a meal together Sometimes there was so much trust between us. There was so much trust and so much love that the intimacy, the experience of intimacy was unbearably joyful. It, it, was, it was unbearable because, because, because temporarily everybody had transcended their self-preoccupation, their egoic self-preoccupation and people were just, they were, were, were in the being together, there was nothing between us. And I noticed that with women, when women and men are together, there's always, there's always a measure of sexual tension. It, it could be gross or it could be very subtle. But I noticed that when I was with a group, within a group of men and there was no sexual tension, 
and everybody was completely undistracted by their their egoic self consciousness, their their neuroses. There was said there was there was such an intoxicating joy and love of just simply being together, and there was so much goodwill. There was a natural there was a natural state and flow of, of incredible goodwill towards each other and kindness and wanting the best for each other and care that was coming spontaneously and naturally and unselfconsciously. So I was very much observing these, these, these collective group states when we, when we would experience ecstasy and joy and goodwill that was, that, that, that was so profound and so powerful. And then as part of this process, I wanted women to be able to have this experience of oneness with each other. Because I noticed that women often, in order to feel complete, usually had to be in a relationship with a man, either in a sexual relationship or with a powerful man. W women often feel that they need to be completed in the context of relationship with a man. And I felt, I felt this, was, this was always a form of bondage for women and women needed to find a way to feel utterly, I, this is part of my thinking, utterly complete in being together with each other. I felt that if women could find a way of experiencing utter completeness and fullness and being together, then they could, it'd be possible for women, men and women to, to achieve a state of genuine equality. But then when I was trying to speak to the women about coming together in this kind of trust, I started to discover, I discovered that women had a lot more trouble trusting each other. I'm, make, I'm making gross generalizations here. So this is always the exception, but I, I noticed that there's a tendency that women have trouble often really trusting each other and there's a lot of competition and, 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 um, and mistrust for all kinds of evolutionary reasons. So I was constantly working on different ways for us to come together in this unity consciousness. And this was a big theme. And so another part of the theme of our work was coming together in a whole on, in a whole on, the, this, this whole, the philosophy of whole, whole on say that the whole universe is built up of whole ons. So a whole on is a whole that's part of a larger whole. So for example, a, a, a atom is a whole on, it's a whole that's part of a molecule. So atom is part of a molecule, which is part of a cell, which is part of an organ, which is part of an organism, which is part of a body, which is part of an ecosystem. So I was starting to see, so I was starting to see what was, was coming apparent to me was larger holes than the unique human individual. I was seeing these larger holes, larger holes than just the unique human individual. And so I was having my students meet in groups. Some, some were large groups and some were small. So I'd have the men and women meet in groups of 10 or 15 people, five, 10, 15 people. And the question is, can we meet in these, in these groups of five, 10 or 15 people and experience A dissolution, of, a dissolution of personal boundaries, dissolution of, dissolution of the ego boundaries, and experience a, a oneness in the context of, of this, the, the whole now, the whole self being the collective, not just the unique individual. And so this is what we were reaching for. Can, I, can we come together? And can this, this whole on, this, this, this group of this collective become the larger, uh, the larger sense of I, and this gets the larger sense of I, the larger I sense becomes the group itself, the group consciousness that's made up of all the individual holons, which are all the individual human beings. And so what, what started to happen is people started to have these experiences of coming together in these groups, and they would start to feel that the group, that the group, the, 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 the group itself started to gain its own, its own consciousness, its own holonic consciousness. And this Holonic consciousness had a kind of collective intelligence or a higher level of intelligence or a higher level of sensitivity and knowing than any unique individual could on their own. So people started to have experience this, this, this state of consciousness where they would come together in these groups and awaken to a consciousness that, that was larger than their own individual consciousness. That was the consciousness of the whole. We call this the new being. So the group, the group, the, the, the collective gained this access to kind of a new, a new, a higher identity in this experience of expanding consciousness of the group. But at the same time, people were also still simultaneously aware of their own unique minds, their own unique personalities, their own unique histories. But, but so we, nobody lost touch of their, of, their own, of their own personal identities and their minds and their memories. They were all still present. 
but they were present in the context of this larger self sense, which, which was made up of the whole, of this, 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 this whole on. So this is what we were working with. And, um, and when, when, this, when, this, when, this, when the state of the, the self would expand to include, to become this whole, the whole group, people started experience, would experience ecstasy, joy, but most importantly, everybody would awaken to an evolutionary potential, a creative evolutionary potential that seemed inherent in this larger self-structure. And this was so unbelievably exciting because the in, inherent in this larger self-structure, people experienced a, a promise of extraordinary creative potential in and through our, our humanity that was larger than any individual and that no, no individual could do on their own. And that's kind of what we were working with, was working with that potential and trying to give rise to it in small groups and in larger groups. So what I was writing about in, 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 the, in the book was when I was pushing towards this breakthrough. So what are you reading? This is before the breakthrough happened, but I was pushing for it and I kept encouraging people, we've got to make this breakthrough. And, it's, and, the, and the way it worked was, I could see this potential before it actually emerged. I saw it in the eyes of my intuition, but it, I didn't have any objective evidence or any proof that it existed, but I was sure it did. And so what happened finally, I got so frustrated that I threw all these guys off the property. I, I, I was so frustrated because nobody was, I thought they weren't making the right kind of effort. And I was desperate, so I threw them off. Then they all, then, and so I really pushed them up against, the, uh, and they, up against the wall. They all went under an enormous existential challenge about how much do I really want, how much do I really believe in this guy? And how much do I want this? Because I thought they didn't want it enough. And so they eventually what they all came back. And then I th put, put them in this, on this retreat. These 30 guys were on a retreat. For, for several months, they were doing meditation all day long and meditation, prostrations and chanting. They had a very strict schedule. But what was very interesting is they were all doing this practice as if their life depended on it. There was a life and death feeling about it that they all brought to it, they this level of commitment. And at some point during this retreat, when they were meeting in the evening and having these discussions, there was a breakthrough. There was like an unbelievable explosion in consciousness breakthrough. And in some of the, their, their, the descriptions of what their experience I put in the book, and, um, and they were all out of their minds with joy, clarity, gratitude, because they realized, oh, this is why he was pushing us so hard. So it was for this, it was for this. And they said, thank you so much. And that was the beginning of what we came to call intersubjective, which means between subjects, intersubjective, non-duality, intersubjective, non-duality. And, and that was the breakthrough. And once we made the breakthrough, it, get, it, it, it became easier and easier over time to access this miraculous, potential is miraculous space. But, but, but what's so exciting about it is what is, is the, what becomes, what becomes possible, I think, for humanity, because you, I'm sure you're well, you're well aware, you can have very smart people like geniuses can come together and share the same space, but they don't necessarily meet in a place that transcends and includes their genius. They usually remain in a separate egoic boxes. But if, if, but if, you, if, but if, if we can learn to meet each other beyond ego, aw aw awaken to non-duality or to, the, to, you know, to awake, aw in this awakened self-transcending state, the, the, the kind of creative process that we could give rise to is just unimaginable. And that's the idea, that's, that's the promise that I still feel is inherent in, in, this, in this practice. So it's, it's not about my enlightenment anymore. It's about the creative potential that, that becomes apparent when we come together beyond ego. The creative potential that emerges when we come together beyond ego. And that was the whole idea. And when people would experience it, they would, it would change their lives. You know, when people would have the experiences, it completely, it completely blew their minds because they saw how much potential there was. It wasn't the end. It was the beginning, it was the revelation of an extraordinary new potential, I believe, in enlightenment itself. Can I just come in and ask something, Andrew? Sorry to butt into... Uh, of, course, of course. So, I mean, when you speak about this amazing ecstasy and bliss and so on, then what happened with those same people? Because it seems they must have been the people who then turned against you later. <laughs> So what happened? <laughs> How can they go from this space you're talking about into 
kind of breaking down and then individually they got pissed off with you and um, whatever happened, you know? Well, I, I think this was, this was uh, would have been year, years, years later. I think some of my senior students felt that I was holding them on too short a leash. Uh -huh. I think some of them wanted to do their own thing. They wanted, they wanted, they wanted a greater auto autonomy because in my thinking, I had very mythic or old fashioned thinking. I thought when you meet the master and you surrender to the master, you're together for eternity. It's the old way of thinking. And I didn't understand, I, I, I failed to recognize that my students were, post, were very postmodern and that they loved me and they adored me. But when they self, when they self actualized and they fully came into their own, they wanted to leave, leave, leave daddy and wanted to maybe, they wanted to do their own thing independently. And that was something at that time, I, I couldn't relate to that. How could, but how could you, how could you want to do your own thing? It just didn't, it's something I didn't understand. And this created a lot of, <laughs> A lot but of you had your own experience of that, Andrew, because Papaji exactly would, be, would have said to you, I think, go off, Andrew, and share, you know, you, you've got it now, take it away, you know, take it and share with other people. Well, that, he, that he did, but I, I, no, they, a lot of them were already independently teaching, but they were teaching evolutionary enlightenment, and a lot of them wanted to do their own thing out, outside of the context of, our, of the larger international group we had, and I couldn't relate to it. And so I think it had to do with... Um, had to, I, th I think a lot of them had to kill off their father so they could be <laughs> a, a lot a lot of there are a lot of there are a lot of archetypal forces that are reminiscent of kind of what happens in greek tragedies that were unfolding <laughs> right right okay sorry to butt in anyway that, that's totally that's totally fine but john your question is very well taken because how in god's name could people be so close and love each other so much and trust each other so much and be so committed to spiritual work together and not be able to solve their own problems and their own conflicts. It's just, it, it's, it's truly tragic and it's, it's paradoxical and hypocritical. We're all guilty. There, we're, there's a huge stalemate. I find it very painful. I don't know what to do about it. I've tried my best to remedy the situation, but it's not, yeah. a, and, I, and I find it, it, because if we can't solve our own problems and solve our own conflicts, what does it all ultimately mean? So I agree with you. I agree with you. I wish I, I wish I, I wish I could solve it. All right, all right. Okay. So anyway, I didn't want to butt into uh, Indira's moment. No, no, Have you got another comeback, Indira? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, what came into my mind was, in a way, I mean, this is in a way what in every spiritual community or also in our community is happening this coming together and focusing together on uh, on consciousness creates a certain energy i mean oh, which yeah. we also feel rising here in the last 15 years yeah yeah so, absolutely yeah and when that happens you can't live any other life because you experience so much intimacy you get used to a level of intimacy and trust yes yes there's it's difficult there's no place to go really anymore yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> i think i yeah. think that's what i think that's what living the spiritual life in earnest has always meant mm. i think that's why when the buddha came to town in ancient india the men walked out on their wives and children to, so they could be with them mm. it's the same thing that happened with the fishermen that followed jesus they, mm -hmm. they couldn't resist the call of the call of the self and unless you've experienced that, you can't understand why. The people mm -hmm. so they, they discovered something so sacred and so precious that it was more important than anything else. Mm -hmm. And I and this and the and this kind of call still exists today, and even in postmodern culture, in, in the leading edge of, of, of in the leading edge of culture is postmodernity, and post postmodern values don't leave room for for this kind of spiritual passion, this kind of spiritual one pointedness. It's still it's. It's because, it's because everybody wanted it so badly, it was so focused on spirit. And to get, a, as I'm sure you guys are aware, to get a group of people, even a small group of people, to focus one pointedly on the evolution of consciousness and the evolution of enlightened awareness is, is, is a magical, so precious and so rare event that happens in the world today. Everybody wants to fit spirituality you know, into, some, into their pocket. There was, it's something they're doing on the side. They have their work and they have their family and they have their recreational activities and then they have their spiritual life but for any of us who want to put the spiritual life first and foremost front and center and give everything to that that's seen as being crazy seen as being too much 
But I think the too muchness is the prerequisite for something really profound being able to happen. And obviously you all feel the same way. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank Lovely. you, Andrew. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Very <laughs> nice to see you again. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Raj, would you like to be named? The next question is a very tough question. He's had this question for 15 years <laughs> and he can never find the answer. So you're his last hope. After, the, <laughs> after this, we're pushing him into the river. <laughs> I'm ready, sir. What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Andrew. Hi. Um, since birth, there were already many fears which haven't been transformed. Can you please talk about this? Thank you, Raj. <laughs> well, wh why did the fears need to be transformed? Well, I don't know if they have to, but um, well, they are influencing. Inherent in the question is the is some kind of belief or conviction that the fears need to be transformed. But why do the why do the fears need to be transformed? Why does anything need to change? Hmm. Well, they interfere. Excuse they me. Are, they are they interfere into um, into flow. Yeah, I understand. But when we stand back and observe our experience and are always drawing conclusions about where we think we're stuck and where we think we're not stuck, we're not just we're not really fully engaging with life. So I I think that um, in in my experience, and I've heard other people confirm, confirm this. Some of our neurotic habits or neurotic tendencies, which are conditioned, might never go away. But if we stop resisting them and stop being so intimidated by them and stop even insisting that they need to go away, we can experience extraordinary freedom even in the midst of all of that. Because, if, because from a certain point of view, nothing really needs to change. If, you, if when, we, when, we, when we recognize who we are, You've all had that experience being with John. When you realize who you are, that's the most, that's the most important discovery. Then you realize because of that, nothing, nothing needs to change. Everything's okay. Nothing needs to change. Everything is okay. And that's, that's when we stop resisting. We stop resisting the fear and the doubt and the confusion and the anger, all of it. We stop resisting and we allow it to be there. But there's, there's, an, un, but there's an unconditional acceptance of the totality of the confusion and the complexity of the neurotic mind. And then we stop struggling with it, we stop fighting with it. We stop needing for it to disappear or needing for it to straighten out. We stop needing for it to change. And when we stop needing for it to change, it stops bothering us so much. Oh, my fear is still there, something's wrong. So what if we, what if we said, well, my fear is still there and nothing's wrong. Mm -hmm. My fear is still there and nothing's wrong. <laughs> Mm -hmm. my, fear, my, my fear may be there for eternity and nothing will be wrong. So it's not the presence of difficult emotions, I think, that creates the problem. It's our refusal to tolerate their presence. That's the problem. So if we can accept it all and, and not insist that it needs to change at all, we can be free in the midst of it. And then it will change. But, the, the, but, the, but the, dis, the disappearance of unpleasant emotions and difficult, difficult emotions is no longer a prerequisite to our inner freedom. So, because then you have to say, oh my God, do you mean I might have to live with this fear forever? And you say, well, maybe yes. Could you do it? <laughs> I have to. <laughs> No, no, but but it, but it's but 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 in the spirit of wanting to be free, I want to be free. That's why I can tolerate this unpleasant emotion because I want to be free.
Because what, often what I tell people is it's not, it's not what we experience inwardly that, that's the issue, it's the conclusions that we, draw, that we draw about ourselves. I'm experiencing fear, I must not be free. I'm experiencing anger, I must not be free. I'm experiencing confusion, I must not be free. I'm experiencing resentment, I must not be free. If I'm free, I only experience perfect happiness without any ripples. I've never met that person. <laughs> and it was very interesting. Uh, Master Punjiji was a very complicated man. And he, he, and in my experience of being with him, he, when he was in, in when he was, when he was deeply in his enlightened state, enlightened bhav, enlightened consciousness, he, he would express the, the innocence of a small child in a way that was, that was un, unbearably beautiful and just so absolutely moving. But when he was in a bad mood, when his ego was really on fire, he was, he was, a, he was, a, he was wretched, wretchedness. I hope nobody minds me saying, but I, I've seen him. He, he was angry and bitter and moody. Did that mean he wasn't the most enlightened person I ever met? No. Hmm. But I've never met such a being that never experienced difficult emotions. And I don't think such a thing actually exists. And I think that maybe Ramana was somebody like that. But I, I just don't think it's, 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 it's what this is all about. And I, and I think it's a false expectation. But I think what's, what's much more helpful is to be, is to choose to be free unconditionally in the face of, of difficult emotions and then realize that it's all okay, that it's all okay, that it's all okay. Nothing needs to change. I don't have to continue with the psychotherapy. I don't have to work anything else out. I just have to learn to accept, accept myself in the fullness of my, in the fullness and complexity of all my imperfection. I have to be able to accept all of this, all of it and love myself very much. And that's what sets us free, it's the acceptance. So I wanna be free is different than I wanna be perfect. But I think we have to give up our, these false ideas that enlightenment means I wanna, and I'll never experience fear, doubt, insecurity, frustration, anxiety. I think it's just, it's, just, it's not real, it's not true. We're living in the world, we're gonna experience all those things. But how well do we handle it? How well do we handle the confusion, the frustration, the anger, the insecurity, and the fear? How well do we handle it? That's the, that's the question. And if we're, if, we're, if we're deeply accepting these things, we should be able to handle it pretty well. If, we, if, if, if I think if we're doing well, nobody's gonna know we're having all these kinds of feelings. Nobody even needs to know. Nobody needs to know. If we're having a bad day, nobody needs to know. So I, I always think how, how we show up is, is much more important than how we feel. Does it help? Yes, very well. You saved him Thank from you. the river. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a runa next. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. She's just on the edge of deciding whether she'll come and join us and live in the community, but at the moment she's here been here for two months as a volunteer. Hello, nice to meet you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. What was your question? Um, I read your interview with uh, JD and Remarkable People. And what struck me most was, uh, was this, let's say, pure determination from very early on. So you were talking about a sense of fearlessness and doubtlessness from the beginning. And there was just this pure determination um, when you were embarking on your spiritual journey. So the question uh, for me then what is coming up is um, obviously you must have been experiencing some ups and downs, but where did this unshakable trust come from? How did you experience that from very early on? Uh, well, because I had, this, I had this powerful experience when I was a teenager, when I was 16. A lot of teenagers have these breakthroughs. I had a very powerful breakthrough. And
And in my early 20s, I realized that nothing else was going to make me happy. And I also had this, because I, I experienced a lot of insecurity as a young person. I, I, felt very, I felt like I couldn't do anything well. I was a terrible student. I barely got through school. So I had a lot of learning problems. I had all kinds of problems. <laughs> I had all kinds of learning problems. And I had a lot of insecurity about being able to do anything well. But in, for some crazy reason, I knew that with this enlightenment process, I knew, that I, I knew that I could somehow get there. I had no doubt that it was just a matter of time and, and some good luck that I, I knew I was going to succeed and I knew I could, I was doubtless about that. And most people are simply not doubtless about that. They're doubtless, doubtless about other things, but most people feel that they're not worthy of enlightenment. And they feel it's such an outrageous possibility that they can't even really take it seriously. A lot of people have trouble taking themselves seriously in relationship to their own potential for enlightenment. But in that one particular area, I think I was, I had a gift or I just, I had, a, I, I, I was doubtless that I could awaken. I, I, and I knew it. I had no doubt about it. I knew it was just a matter of time. That was number one. And the other thing, number two is I knew I didn't want anything else. So even when I came to India and, I, and I'd already been doing a lot of meditation at home in America, when I came to India and I was going to meditation retreats, I would meet people and we'd have wonderful talks about enlightenment and very inspired talks right after the meditation retreat. But then I'd see them on, on a beach a week later and they were in a new relation, in a new sexual relationship and they were drinking alcohol again. And, and they were, it was gone, it was all gone from there. And I saw so many people, they just weren't serious. You know, they got serious, they would get serious for a few minutes, but they would lose their focus. And then they, everybody went, at that time, that was in the uh, 80s, everybody went back to Europe or to America and they got married and they had kids and they, got, and they had jobs. And I knew I could never do that. I was never going to compromise. I was never going to go back. And I was never going to do that. And I, a part of me wanted to. I wanted, you know, just get into a relationship and get into some kind of comfortable life. But I knew I could never do that. I would rather, I, the feeling I had at times, I'd rather die. So I was absolutely determined to succeed. And for some reason, I knew that I always could. I had no doubt that I was going to be able to succeed. And that's what, that's what kept me going. That's why, that's, that's, why when I'm, that's why in my teaching, I, I always tell people, you have to want this more than you want anything else. And did that stay with you even uh, through times of crisis? Because I read yeah, yeah. about uh, when your community was falling apart and you were feeling actually very depressed. Did that uh, strong uh, will stay with you? It was deeper than depression. It was, it was like I was bro broken. Uh, yes, I, I, I remained doubtless about the gift that the master had given me. I remained doubtless about it. I was, I was in a huge mess. And I didn't know how to get out of the mess. But I never doubted the gift that had been given to me. And that my, that my life was only going to be about that gift that I never had any doubt about. I wasn't quite sure about how to solve the problem that I had created. <laughs> I did, I did my best, and I and I think I and I was very earnest and very sincere about it. But um, but I I never I never doubted that what the, that the most important thing was the gift that I'd been given, what I'd given my life to, and I knew my life was only going to ever be about that, in spite of everything that had happened. So no, I never doubted that. But but there was a time during my the, lo, the lowest period of my lo, the lowest period and during after my community fell apart when I was in Calcutta. And I was, I was serving in Mother Teresa's mission in Calcutta. You heard about it, that place? Yeah. And, I, and, I, and my mind went to, into, into an incredibly dark place. Have you ever heard of the, the Screw Tape Letters? This book, I forgot the name, I forgot the name of the, the author, but the, the book is about, is about the devil who tries to get Christians who have a very deep faith to, to try to get them to kind of to let go of their faith and turn against God. So I literally felt like the devil was tempting me because I, I was in such a dark place that all I could see was that I, I've never been a nihilistic person. You know what nihilist, nihilistic means? Nihilistic means it's, it's you believe that there is nothing. All you see is dead matter everywhere and there's, there's, the, there, there's no creativity, there's no life, there's no love, there's no beauty. So I could feel that the, there was a, this, 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 the devil was trying to convince me that everything I'd given my life to was unreal, was just a big fantasy, what, it, it wasn't real. 
There was a voice in my head and I felt like the devil was tempting me. And all I could see was dead matter everywhere. And I was starting to feel like, suff- like I was spiritually, I was suffocating, but I knew it wasn't true. I knew that this was all, my mind had gone to a dark place. I knew the devil inside was trying to tempt me, but I was still, I knew what was happening and I knew it wasn't going to get me, but it was really the closest I've ever been to hell in my life. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have, we have Marco now who is Italian. So maybe you speak a little bit more slowly for him. Sure. <laughs> my, my, my English is not that bad. Then the rest of us can also understand. You, know? <laughs> you speak roughly twice as fast as anybody else I've ever met. <laughs> That's why your chapter was twice as long. <laughs> You're good value, you know, you get more words in each minute. <laughs> Marco, sei italiano? Sei italiano? So, nice to meet you, first of all. Um, my question is about uh, the fact that I can get easily into silence when I meditate, for example, but um, I, I, I expect to experience also love there, but I don't. And so the question I have is, uh, um, is love deeper than space? Uh, sorry, is love deeper, deeper than silence? And the other question is, how can I experience love? Well, I'm not, when you use the word love, what, what are you referring to, romantic love? No, I'm talking about like universal love and unconditional love. The real one. This feeling of being connecting to everything and everybody, and uh, and when you're and when you're into this, this this space of silence, you don't experience. I just experience silence, very quiet, a complete quietness, and uh, very beautiful. Yes, but uh, what, hold. Let's go slowly. So, what makes the silence beautiful? The absence of thought, for example. Yeah, uh, but 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 there must be the, but the absence of thought alone doesn't give rise to beauty. That's a good point. <laughs> um, I, I, for, for, I, the way I perceive it is that it's, it's so quiet and so restful and um, so cozy. I understand but, that, but, but, but I, I understand that. But what I want to ask you, I'm trying to. Uh, what I want, what I want to understand is. What is it that's beautiful? Or you were using the word cozy. What is it that's beautiful about the silence? Or in, what, is, what is it that's beautiful in the silence? I don't know. But yeah, but, but you need to know. You need to know because, because the, problem, the problem is that we often, we, we, the mind has expectations that, have, that are based upon thought and not based upon reality itself. And so we often, we often bring our mind with us into these deeper states of consciousness and are waiting for the state of consciousness to produce what the thought or the, or the thought of the memory is dragging along. And, 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 and that obscures our, our, our ability to fully grasp what's actually happening to us. So I, I would venture to guess that what you're, what you're looking for is inherent in what you're calling the beauty, that which is beautiful. And if you can start, if you can go more deeply into, into, into what's so captivating and so beautiful about the silence, you might find the very thing that, you're, that you say isn't there. Right. Yes, okay, that, that, that was a very good insight. Okay. Need to... Because, because, because when you, you said, because it's not just silence, is it? It's not just the absence of thought. There's, there's the presence of something, no? No, there is more than that to that, but I, that, the point is, I, I wouldn't describe it as love. And I had once an experience of this universal love, which was very, very short, and perhaps I, I still have it in my, in my mind, and then I try to get it. But what, what Master Punjiji helped me to understand was that uh, memories memories 
of spiritual moments or spiritual experiences become like a ball in a chain on our soul. Right. So can we, can we let go of the memories right. of these extraordinary spiritual moments so we can actually, because only then can we see what's happening now, because otherwise we're always going to be comparing with the mind the, the memory of something that happened a long time ago, and the memory is not the thing itself. So we need to kind of clear out, clear the decks. Right. And so for you, the, there is no diff, there is no layering, so to say, of like silence and love. It's all there. It, it must be all there. It's, well, so. I, in my experience, they're 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 of a they're all they're all it's, it's all one mystery. Yeah. It's all one mystery, and then some. Sometimes there's. It's experienced as, 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 I mean, I experience, uh, my experience of this, this, what you're describing is, it's the awakening to the consciousness of eternity. Awakening to the consciousness of eternity. In the consciousness of eternity, there's unconditional freedom and joy. And knowing knowing and it's the knowing that's so incredibly fulfilling it's the knowing and inherent in the knowing is love but the reason why i don't like to use the word love very often because it usually it usually is attached to the personal dimension of the human experience i love you you love me she loves me i love her so it's difficult, to, it's difficult to speak about love in a way that's not personal. God loves me. <laughs> I love God and God loves me. It almost sounds absurd to say, and that's ridiculous. So that's why I, 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 I don't use that word too often because, because I'm always afraid people are going to personalize it. So, but I'm quite sure, Marco, that what you're looking for is already there in your own experience. If you can let go of the memory of something beautiful that happened to you once a long time ago, you'll be able to rediscover it all over again. But you have to have the courage to let go of the memory. Does, does that make sense? Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Because it requires a lot of trust. Because sometimes the, the memory of the, because usually we have some amazing moment or amazing experience that was the most beautiful moment of our life. And because we know it's the most beautiful moment of our life, we don't want to let go of it. So the, so the, the risk we have to take is to, is to be willing to let go of even the most important moment of our life and trust God even more in that. And that, opens, that opens us up to infinite, infinite, infinite possibilities of further development and insights and revelations and growth. Grazie. Grazie. <laughs> So now we have Rajen, who is actually Norwegian. So he would also appreciate, you know, half rate. <laughs> <laughs> you will also appreciate with him, he's also got a big accent. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question, sir? <laughs> 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 Good question. Um, what you just said about letting go of the um, spiritual experiences, um, I can see it's been really uh, something I was addicted to, to, to kind of treasure these moments and come back to them and see yeah, how I can make them stronger and so on. But the, the, way, the way to do that is by letting go of them. Mm. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, that's what the master taught. Mm. That's what he taught. And, he, and this was a quite a, it was a powerful teaching. He continually said, to just, he continually would encourage his, his students to let go of everything. Mm. But, but continuously, Mm. So this the state of receptivity is when we're, is when we're 
letting go of everything continuously, continuously dropping everything, continuously letting go of, letting go of everything, attached to nothing, free and open, mm. but neither here nor there. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> it. It is, and it takes, like I was telling Mark, it takes a lot of courage. Mm, mm. Because if, if we've had a beautiful moment or a beautiful experience that's been the most important moment in our life, where we, we, do, we were attached to it and we're afraid of letting go of it. But if we have the courage to let go of it, that's, a, that's, that's what trust in God means. Mm. It's also what was talked about um, um, yeah, this commitment to freedom. And uh, um, I joined the community about six months ago. Um, and in the beginning, I could really, I was experienced these tests of commitment. And it was kind of just kind of bigger and bigger tests. Um, but then there was also at some point, this realization that um, it doesn't really matter like what kind of test it is if if the conviction is really there to to go for this that's true and then um, then it just disappears and there's challenges but there's no real tests in this way anymore because uh, it's been uh, accepted or surrendered it's uh, yeah it's just uh, no other way to to live life yeah. That's right. That's that's exactly that's exactly right. Mm. It's very good. Mm. Yeah, and then it's not really it's not up to me to what happens. It's uh, happening. That's right. It's just if you have the commitment to go all the way, then you're ready for whatever is going to happen. Mm. Yeah, I also see. Uh, um, things that happen in the um, or kind of tasks I get to do and experiences I make that before I would probably not do it or I would say no now it's <laughs> it's not really possible to say no if it shows up and then it's uh, an amazing experience and uh, it just uh, flows by itself naturally and um, I don't need to to interfere or to to do something about it really Sounds like you're on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're hoping to start a school and uh, actually Rajen is the, is the teacher for our new school. It's really? rather an exciting project. And what, what's, what kind of school will that be? Well, a primary school, you know, from six years old, six or seven oh, wow. years old. Oh, wow. Yeah. And in fact, this weekend, we've got seven kids together and we're doing a kind of practice weekend. We call it Love and Creativity School. Beautiful. Yeah. We Beautiful. don't know if we can manifest it. It's a, a beginning project, which Rajen has got lots of energy for. Fabulous. Yeah, and this was also something that uh, I think it was... Uh, inside of me somehow as a, as a dream or a vision, but I would never have really, uh, really gone for it before because I used to be a, a kind of a normal um, school teacher in high school. I see. So I preferred kind of working with older kids or like basically almost adults. It's a bit easier and you can relate more intellectually. Um, and also I found it a bit difficult to, to try to bring this maybe uh, awareness or something really deeper into it because it's so uh, so foreign for the for the students but now it's it's kind of coming together as a very special project and all of this that i couldn't really bring into the teaching myself now it's um, seems to be happening it sounds very exciting very very creative very full of enormous potential mm. very fulfilling yeah, and I also see it with the kids that there's really moments of, uh, of amazing uh, flow and this uh, energy field that you also talked about. It's uh, just pure awareness working and they, yeah, at times they can really interact so 
just so naturally. And uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing to witness. Beautiful. That's a great idea. Mm. Maybe it can become a, it can become a really a real established practice what you're doing. The, the, yeah, was, our, our world needs it desperately. Yeah, and uh, I I really feel it for the next uh, generation that they they need to come back to to who they really are and not live in this uh, kind of fictional realities. Everybody does. Yeah, I, <laughs> all generations. <laughs> so uh, actually, my, my question to you was about this, uh, which Indira also mentioned, um, a collective energy or like collective enlightenment or energy field. And uh, after what happened to your community, are you still uh, are you still kind of working on this vision? Is this what you're doing at the moment as well? Or absolutely. Mm. I will be. I will be for as long as I live. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I find it very fascinating. It's uh, it resonates with what we do as living in a community as well. No, Absolutely. I mean, what can be felt here, um, but it's still something, uh, at least for me, something mysterious. Uh, what is happening on a collective level and what is happening on the individual level and what's really the the difference there or is there a difference well well when you when it gets very when it becomes very powerful it's hard it's hard to it's hard to be able to see what the difference actually is at a certain point because it becomes mm. just one pro one process mm. that's when it gets most interesting i think when we lose our when we lose when we lose the attachment to our separate self sense and we're and we're being ourself fully in spite of that mm -hmm. we're being ourself fully in spite of that then we, we then we don't know who we are and we're constantly finding out in the most delightful and extraordinary and profound way so it's like living in a state of constant self discovery mm -hmm. free from ego yeah, and still not perfect. I also found that very nice. Yeah. Never going to happen. Mm, exactly. <laughs> we can experience perfection, but we can never be perfection. Mm -hmm. We can experience that which is perfect, but we can never be that which is perfect. Mm. This is also, uh, yeah, I mean, this is freedom that you don't need to, to strive for this perfection. Well, that's it, an old idea. Mm. So it's, an ancient, yeah. it's an ancient idea that we need to outgrow. But we want to strive. To, we want to strive to be better people, more sensitive, more, more intelligent, more kind, more compassionate, more generous, more sophisticated. We want to strive to improve ourselves, but not to be, not to be perfect. Okay, okay. we have now our community cook. <laughs> Pavati, Pavati. She is, uh, um, how can I say, keeping us all fed on very healthy, um, delicious food. She's the guru. Of, she's the guru of the kitchen. The kitchen guru. I think I, I experienced her her fabulous cooking. Did I not? Probably. Probably, probably yes. <laughs> That's when we ate. We ate in your dining room with um, beautiful silverware and beautiful plates, yeah. and the, the, and and everybody was so civilized and polite. And... <laughs> everybody was what? Civilized. And you still and everybody was so civilized. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is Europe, you know. This is Europe. I would like to say in the beginning, I feel very shaken by this conversation and. Uh, Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> something inside is very much touched from what you said about this collective. Mm. Um, I never thought about this, but something inside of me is totally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so and my question is uh, actually, yeah. Mm, I had um, some weeks ago, I had an email conversation with my master, John David. 
And uh, I told him how I feel during so how my state is or whatever you can say my English is also not so perfect. <laughs> and um, so he wrote back to me that what I've experienced is emptiness, probably, but not fully liberation. And uh, my question is now what I also asked him <laughs> now I asked you, what else can I do? <laughs> Keep cooking. <laughs> so the question is, what else? What else can you do to be free? You mean? Pardon? What else can you do to be free? Is that the question? Yeah. yeah. Well, freedom is always only about letting go. No. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, there's two there's two dimensions so one is letting go and the other is paying attention so letting go and paying attention and 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 then there's the matter of grace Yeah, this is what I wrote to him. <laughs> what did you say? I, I just wrote to him, uh, is there anything else to do? But it was, or is it a matter of grace, which I wrote in many spiritual experiences from other people, and you know, that then grace happened for the last bit, or <laughs> <laughs> how to say. In my daily life, I don't have the longing all the time of uh, not like you uh, descri described it in your in your um, in the remarkable book also. No? You have this determined, but I have the feeling that I'm on the right place. That everything is all right. Actually, it's all so fine. Is, it, is, there, but, anything, is there anything missing? No, <laughs> not really. But, that, but, but there that, is a thought in the back that I should miss something. <laughs> so, 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 so what? So what if? What if you could just disregard that thought? I don't understand what disregard means in this moment. If you could let go of that thought. Yeah. Then would anything be missing? I think I had also a little bit the idea there must be an explosion. Yes, because many have these big experiences and then now and now you know, you lose it again, but you know. And but I never had this explosionally <laughs> uh, experiences. Like I saw also here in the community and uh, Lots of energy and going through, and then no, but but the, the but the but those explosions only mean as much as their result. Mm -hmm. They don't mean anything in themselves; it's just an experience. Mm -hmm. So, what's the result? The result is what's is what's important, not the experience itself. Mm -hmm. So, do you, do you have any doubt? Do you do you, do you have any doubt that God is? Did God exist? No. Do you have any doubt that you are that you are God? I don't. This is no question. But then, so that's that's it. Mm -hmm. What more do you What more do you need to know? Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Huh? Mm. <laughs> that was a, that's a question. Mm. So what's the answer? Keep cooking. <laughs> Keep cooking. <laughs> Expansion is now in, in the moment the answer. Huh? 
Some expansion is here is the answer. I, I have no no thought about. Yeah, but but what I'm what I'm what I'm saying is I think that without this thought that something else needs to happen, you'd be free. Because nothing else really needs to happen because everything already has happened. Because you're already convinced. Right? Are you already convinced? <laughs> I must think about it. No? <laughs> but, but you said, but you said a few minutes ago that you were convinced, mm. right? So once, so once we're convinced, then all we have to do is trust that and let let everything else go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have Prema, who's an unusual character. She's been here for many, many years. <laughs> hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> mm. I have also a question. Yes, please. Um. <laughs> A few months ago, I had a small glimpse where I could see for myself that this wounded little girl inside does not really exist. Now it feels that through daily life, things inside gets triggered. They are very familiar and habitual emotions, thought patterns, etc. noticed. And then through inquiry, there's a seeing and realizing that's not really me. I am much beyond that. And then slowly everything settles down again and I rest in something calm. The question is, is that it slowly a dissolving or is there something more to come? Oh, there's something more to come for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, when, when, you, when we say, is that it? In other words, when people say, is that it? So that means you're pointing, we're, we're pointing at something like, like here, you say, is this it? You know, this is just my phone. So is this experience, is this experience it? Or is this thing it? Is this thought it? Is this feeling it? God is I'm, not a thought. God's not a thought. It's not a feeling and it's not an object. God's not a thought, not a feeling and not an object. God is both every, everything and nothing at the same time. So the mind is always trying to locate reality. And so that's why the master taught us all to transcend the mind and stop trying to locate ourselves with the mind. And then we, then we'll realize we've always been there. We've never left, we've always been there. But experiences come and go, they're not the thing itself. It's the letting go of the mind and the mind's insistence on trying to determine what reality actually is. When we let go of the mind, we find that we're always there. Whether we feel like it, whether when we feel like it and when we don't feel like it, it doesn't make any difference. So when people say, is this it? Nothing is it. Nothing is it. Does that make sense to you? Is that clear? Yes, yes. I mean... And you don't want to spend too much time thinking about the wounded little girl either. No, I don't. You know, but you brought her up in your question. Well, isn't she... It, was, didn't that all happen a long time ago? Sorry, no, I, I don't understand. Did it, didn't what happened to that little girl happen a long time ago? Yeah, this happened a long time ago. 
Okay. So it doesn't it doesn't have to mean anything now, does it? No. Good. So if it doesn't mean anything now, then we then we should we don't need to talk about it anymore. Unless we need to. If we need to talk about it, then we do talk about it. But if we don't need to talk about it, we don't talk about it. Because we have to be careful about what we make real. What we, what we what we make real is what we feel is what we talk about. So we can experience all kinds of things that we did to decide are all irrelevant. But the things we talk about, we talk about them because we feel they're important. So we want to be very careful and very mindful of what we talk about and what we believe is important. And we want to make sure that they, what we're talking about really is actually important, and not ultimately irrelevant. So you're, you're, so you're, you're living in an enlightenment community. If you were living, if you were living in a psychotherapy community, then everybody probably would be talking about their wounds. But if, because you're in an enlightenment community, people tend to talk more about the light of enlightened awareness. And in the light of enlightened awareness, there's no woundedness, which is the whole, which is the whole point. So what we want to try and share, if we, what we want to try and share together in an, enlightenment in an enlightenment community is the light of enlightened awareness in which there's no woundedness. If we can share that together, the woundedness begins to fall away from us. And then we realize that we've always been free. And it's all good. It takes a lot of courage though, and a lot of uh, audacity. To be free means we have to be audacious and outrageous. Okay, so we have Kieran next. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. We've got a couple more, so I want to kind of push it along because you're probably getting tired. So far, so good. <laughs> so Kieran is a, is a wonderful musician. He's a drummer and he's the leader of our Open Sky band. Yes, I know. And... I know. We're, we, 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 we've met. Great to meet you again. Nice to see you again. How are you doing? <laughs> yes. He's you now a plumber, actually. <laughs> From drama to plumber. <laughs> uh, who knows who's, who, what will come next? <laughs> yeah, it's nice to see you. Yeah. Yeah. What was your question? Yes, I was very, very touched also with uh, what you uh, said, uh, what you talked about with Raj, this question about freedom, um, the fear, sorry, about fear, um, and acceptance. Yeah. So what, what is going on in uh, around myself is a lot of strong energies, I feel in the body and then around and uh, this can carry different things. This can carry joy and uh, power for action and can carry also very strong pain and sadness. And, just, and then um, so, sometimes I can just be with it and there sometimes something changes and sometimes I get very unfocused and distracted. And um, yes, but there, there's always a, a very strong longing for um, yeah, melting, for just, uh, I don't know, being for So uh, what, what, what's the question exactly? 
Um, in last January, when we had to talk, you said um, there's just two ways. There's letting go 200% and trusting and uh, or being very rigid, strict yogi and in your practice. But this is this, I feel that's the same. Yeah, that is like going 200% for something. And uh, there is very strong longing and to do this. And sometimes there's a very strong distraction and how how to deal with that. But what do you want to do? on what you want to do? <laughs> what do you want to do? Because you, you're saying, I feel this way and I feel that way. I said, well, that, that's, that's what we do. We feel this way, we feel that way. But what do you want to do? Accept. What? Accept. <laughs> no, but the point is, what, 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 what do you want in your life? What is the most important thing? What do you want? What are you striving for? What are you living for? What do you care about? Freedom. So therefore, choose the activities and the thoughts and the action. Yeah, choose the actions and the thoughts that will bring you closer and closer to freedom. Right? So there's some effort, some doing. Always. always. Yes. When you when you get it, when you brush your teeth in the morning, is that effortless? Depends. Sometimes yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mostly, I would say yes. In, in, of course, I need my muscles. Yeah, but I don't need uh, effort from. It goes. Yeah, just. Uh... But you brush your teeth because it's because you should brush your teeth, right? Not not always because you want to, right? Because I want it, yeah. No, no, you brush your teeth because you should, not because you want to, right? I'll, I'll speak about myself. Ah, because I should. I brush my uh, teeth because I should, not because I want. I don't do. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I don't because I don't. I don't. Just don't want. <laughs> I, I don't think I'm clear on what your question is actually. I feel a little confused. Me too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which country are you from again? Are you from South America somewhere? <laughs> Last time we asked the same question. No, I'm from Berlin. I'm from Germany. Ber oh, Germany, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now okay. <laughs> well, you recognize, yeah. So Daniela just sent me a text. Daniela, who's there, my student, can you see her? She said, funny, he always asked the same question. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get it. Sorry. Daniela, who's there, she just sent me a text. Yeah. Well, and she said, funny, he always asks the same question. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not clear what the question is, though. That's the thing. <laughs> I don't understand everything you say. Sorry. I'm not clear what your question is. I'm sorry. Is this just acceptance? Is it enough? Is there just acceptance? Is that enough? Enough it's... for what? Again, it's what, what, what do you want? Acceptance. <laughs> Acceptance of everything. Because that's, that's, that's freedom. Yeah, but uh, acceptance isn't always, the right, isn't always the right approach. Martin Luther King wasn't accepting things the way they are. Gandhi wasn't accepting things the way they are. 
Jesus wasn't accepting things the way they were. Right? Sometimes acceptance is just passivity. Acceptance what comes up inside. But again, I, I can't tell you what to, you have to do what you want to do. It depends on what you want. What, what do you want? What do you want? You're making me feel helpless. <laughs> no. What, what do you want? Uh, to be able to accept everything what is happening in life and uh, yeah but is that and, is, is that a good thing aren't something aren't aren't some things unacceptable no yeah okay okay <laughs> but, <laughs> but i mean in a in a way of non non resisting non resisting to or to that because that creates suffering then resisting yes you need to you need to do what you feel you need to do to to succeed in what you want to succeed at do whatever you need to do to succeed But you're making me feel very helpless. I don't know why that's happening, but I feel helpless. Okay. <laughs> I see I'm not clear. <laughs> but, but, but but I think what you need to be aware of is that your lack of clarity has having an effect on me. So it, it's not just that you're not clear, but you're transmitting in this conversation, for example, you're transmitting a lack of clarity. So the, I'm, that lack of clarity is affecting me. Mm. So it's not just a passive inner experience you're having, you're, you're, you're transmitting that, that feeling to me. Mm. Do you want me to feel helpless? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, well, that, that, that's good. <laughs> okay. So we give you now Saraswati, and Thank she's she's our newest uh, resident in the community. Or well, no, not quite. But anyway, she's a, a young lady who is finding her way. Saraswati. Hello. Hello. Um. So my question is about um, how can I become really content and without desires um, and expectations to get something from the outside? Well, what is it that you want? Mm. What is it that you want? Uh, I want contentment with myself and to not this feeling, to not have this feeling to need something from somebody or from the outside. Do you meditate? Yes. Do you ever get the feeling when you meditate that you're free?
Yes, I mean, kind of. I have this feeling to be content. Yes, also. that's what I mean. Do you ever have the feeling when you're meditating of absolute contentment that you need nothing from anybody, that everything is within you? Not always, but I know this. Yeah, but not always, but you get to, but well, that's the answer to the question. Mm -hmm. Because I think that the, medit the, 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 meditated, med the meditation process is a way in which we can find independence. If you can find real depth in meditation, it can help you, it can help us to become very independent, in, independent human beings, not dependent on others, but independent. Because then we realize that there's this fullness, this fullness, this completeness, the source of contentment lies within us as our, as our own true self. It's, it's always already there. But, but if we understand it with the mind, it doesn't help. We need to have the experience again and again. We need to have the experience every day. And, it's, and, it, and when it's a living experience, we want to stay in that stillness longer and longer and longer and longer because it's so fulfilling. Because it's such a source of contentment. It's such a source of happiness, such a source of joy, such a source of freedom. So then we don't need anything. We, we feel in that state that we don't need anybody else's approval. We don't need anybody else's affirmation or affection. Because, because, the, 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 because the experience of, of fullness and completeness is already, already exists within us. But this needs to be developed. That's why we need to do spiritual practice to develop this, this experience, to develop this state. And then when it gets deep enough, it becomes a source of what I call spiritual self-confidence. Because I think in human relationships, if I need something from you or you need something from me, we can't have a relationship that's about freedom. If I need you and you need me, then we won't be free in the relationship. I, if, if we were to come together in a relationship, I would want to offer you my fullness and you'd want to offer me your fullness. I want to offer you my completeness. You'd want to offer me your completeness. But if I, if, if I'm, if I, if I, if I bring you my neediness and you bring me your neediness, this is not going to be, have a good outcome. So in the enlightenment context, because these conversations are taking place in the enlightenment context, enlightenment is about finding, finding this fullness and this completeness within our own selves. So the source of liberation is always within, within the depths of, our, of, of ourselves. We want to really, we want to we awaken to this truth and then develop it and nurture it and develop it and nurture it and develop it and nurture it. So we can come, become very strong and very independent in our fullness. And the more independent we become in our fullness, the fullness becomes an attractor. It starts attracting other people. That's why your teacher, your master, is attracting all of you because of the power of the fullness that he's realized in his own self that he's transmitting to other people. The fullness becomes an attractor. As we become attracted to the fullness in the spiritual master, that's a reflection of the fullness in ourselves. But the answer to the question lies within ourselves. And if we can, if we can I think we need to do that first and then worry about the questions of human relationships and all those things after we find ourself. So the first thing is to find ourself and then we can answer, ask the more difficult questions about how to live, uh, live more perfectly a human life. But if we haven't found ourself, we're gonna be like a beggar. We're gonna be living our life like a beggar. And it's not a wholesome way to live. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the enlightenment experience reveals to us directly that everything lies within us. Everything is everything, but we need we need to we need to do the work, and if we do the work, we become settled and grounded in ourselves, and then then we'll start attract other people will begin to find us very attractive because they're attracted to the fullness. Okay. Yes. Um. How can I um. After meditation, I mean, how can I integrate this state in daily life? don't do anything in your daily life that would betray what you've realized in the meditation. Don't do anything in your daily life that would betray what you've realized in the meditation. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. We have Go <coughs> we have Govinda, who is uh, well. He is who you'll see. He is. <laughs> 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 nice, to, nice to see you. I think I've met you before, no? Yes, yes. Mm. You met me one time when I was in a, a phase where I had um, a lot of judgments about climate change and about the world, and I was crying myself out to you in a particular short moment. <laughs> And you were, it was very helpful because you just said, yes, we don't know what's going to happen. It could, you actually, you said, um, it could be true what you say. We don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you removed the drama out of it by just pointing forward. This was um, very helpful. Very good. Very good. So what, what, what question do you have today? <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, um, I would first like to share more about myself, because I think this is more important than my sure. question I came with. And I think since then, um, it became more open. And um, I have a lot of moments or in the day in between, I can see clearly see that I'm God, I'm the consciousness. I'm basically everything which could ever possibly exist condensed into a single moment, which is this instant. But I also have a lot of doubts because I have a very doubtful mind. And, um, I lose this connection also. So, um, yeah, this is, can you comment on this? I'm actually going to be giving a talk on this subject in a couple of hours. About, <laughs> about, this, about this, the significance of doubtlessness. So, it's, so the, the essence of what I feel is once we have seen God or God has revealed herself to us, and once we, we realize I have, I have seen God face to face, I know who God is. We admit it, we bear, we, we be, bear witness to this truth. We bear witness to this, this truth in front of the whole world. Mm -hmm. From that moment on, we have, to, we have to have the courage to never doubt that. No matter what we're feeling, no matter what we're thinking, no matter what's happening to us or what's happening around us. And if we have the courage never to doubt what we, the deepest truth that we've realized, we will always be free. And it takes a lot of courage because sometimes the way we feel and, and what's happening around us can create a lot of insecurity. So do we, do we have enough, enough conviction to never doubt once, once we know that we know? Once we know that we know, do we, have the, do we have the conviction to never move from that position, no matter what's happening, no matter what's happening, no matter what's happening? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the most important prerequisite to the stabilization of enlightenment, of enlightenment. This is, 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 is doubtlessness. And the doubtlessness is based upon what we, what, we have, what we know to be true, not necessarily on what we're experiencing in the present moment. Mm -hmm. Based on what we've known to be true in our deepest moments. That, and that's what we hold to that, no matter what we're experiencing in the present moment. No matter what we're experiencing in the present moment, it doesn't make any difference. Because we know that we know what the truth really is. We're not willing to ever doubt that or ever compromise that. Does that help? Yeah, I mean, it's beautiful. <laughs> it touches me. But does it beautiful. help? Does it help? <laughs> 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 a bit, yeah. I, I feel I like need to have this repeated every day, like a mantra, you know. Because I, uh, and right now, for example, this all there comes a shaky feeling of insecurity up, and 
for so long. Just because I listen to your words, I can somehow um, yeah, stand just, with it. But just, if it but, wouldn't be... <laughs> just, but just because the shaky feeling of insecurity comes, it doesn't mean you need to doubt anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No doubt is freedom, my friend. <laughs> okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So I really like to thank you so much, Andrew. It's been, uh, as always with you, totally on many levels. You know, you have this ability to talk very quickly. And also you have the ability to project tremendous energy. And also, I think what I would call love, you know, it's not a personal love, but you project an enormous um, force of love. Force of love, I think, is good expression thank you thank and, you so much. Uh, it's been wonderful i mean i find myself very touched at the moment because for one month i'm sitting every day non-stop from the morning until the midnight with papaji you know because i'm cutting all kind of wonderful quotations from people about their experiences with him and he's sitting in my head it's really a strange feeling he's somehow he's in my brain every day it's hard to describe it but he's putting this book together it's really amazing i don't know i've never experienced such a thing you know he's really in my head and suddenly he will direct me you know to something i wouldn't have thought about wow it, it's all kind of coming together in the most amazing way in the touching way and you know somehow this talk now with you is a a byproduct of this whole thing, you know? So I'm very touched that we could have this time with you. And I really thank you for, for giving this time to us. Well, thank you, I, I appreciate it. I wanted to ask you that when we, we met, a, we met I think three years ago, then I came and spoke at your retreat for the next two years. And you told me that, um, you mentioned that he had spoken to you about you or you felt that he'd spoken to you about me and he asked you to help in some way do you remember that yeah yeah that's how i mean actually this is i mean this is the beginning of us connecting you know because um i had tried to meet you actually a few times but i couldn't ever get through to you you were too important in those days <laughs> but <laughs> but when you crashed a bit, you know, I mean, I know in America you're very crashed, but here in Europe, I don't see you as so crashed. And um, anyway, you can crash, but your wisdom doesn't uh, suddenly disappear or something. So I'm enjoying that we can enjoy your wisdom. And, you know, I don't know how to have a problem with all that, you know. But anyway, yes, I mean, definitely there was this kind of inner voice from, I think it was him actually, saying that I should somehow get involved. But I found it, I, I kind of denied it because it seemed too stupid. Why would I get involved? You know, what could I do possibly, yeah? But I mean, the, the, the energy of that didn't go away. And, and then if you remember, there was a situation where one of my students saw you in a cafe in Tiru and I thought, well, okay, this is the moment, you know. And then out of that, we've met now quite a few times. So it's fantastic. It's fantastic. So I somehow have some kind of, um, I don't know, I can't really explain. I call it divine intelligence, actually. But yeah. this divine intelligence, which is a kind of general intelligence, but often like now it seems particularly papaji representing the intelligence something like that and so my life has been directed by this intelligence for many years now 
in the most wonderful ways. Like today we're doing this experimental school and we're planning now to make a school. And this came out of meeting a young woman 10 years ago and we had two children. So I, I think, you know, I have two five-year-old little girls. So we want, I want to make a school for them actually, because I don't want them in, I don't want them in the system. You know, I don't want them, I don't want all that stuff on them. They're, they're so pure and lovely. I can't stand the idea that they have to go into that system. So we're going to make our own school, you know, and, and somehow existence has given me the possibility of actually doing that school. Like this man, Rajen, he's really a lovely man and the kids absolutely love him. And we have several other lovely people in our community who particularly like to be with kids. So suddenly this community has absolutely got the tools to make such a school, you know, and that's completely touching to me. But it, it's not anybody's idea. It just kind of in a flow, you could say. Well, the, the creativity happening around you all the time is quite inspiring. You're, you're, you're a font of, create, of creative creativity. It's amazing. Somehow, yeah, somehow, yeah. But I would say since I've been living in this community of around 18, 20 people for now it's 16 years, you know, it, we can't talk about it in the way that you can talk about it. But when you talk about this collective, I would say we've been, we're living now this collective. And um, so the way you talk about it and the way I experience it, I mean, is, is the same thing. I, I imagine. Actually. Yeah, yeah. And, and then all these wonderful things, they just happen out of this collective. And... Um, yeah, so yeah, I feel we're a kind of living example of what you what you've got you've got the theory, and we're in doing the practice. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you're like you're like you're like you're like an, an organism. One, <laughs> yeah, one, yeah, an organism. we're like an ant hill, ant hill, you know. <laughs> we're a tribe of ants. Yeah, well, I imagine you see this. Like for example, this man, Kiran, you know, with his doubting question, you know, I can hardly stand to hear it. I mean, all he needs to do is to play his drum, you know, he's so good on his drum, he's so good on his flute. I mean, he's a brilliant musician, yeah? So this Pavati with her cooking, she produces every day amazing food, every day, every day, every day, you know? So she just needs to cook, you know? And people, don't seem to see their own beauty and their own manifestation. You know, we all have some kind of manifestation and we just, let's manifest, that's it. We all have unique gifts to, gifts to give that are our own. Absolutely. Yeah. Fabulous, but your, your community is like a creative organism, no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's amazing, I mean, when you were talking about what came out of that, it, that, that kind of experiment with those guys, you yes. had words like, you know, uh, joy, bliss, uh, very strong, emotional, wonderful words. And in our case, maybe it's not always so wonderful words, but wonderful, practical life, you know, somebody goes and plays the piano, then somebody is doing a, a new, making a new bathroom, uh, so many things are happening on many levels every day in this community that I'm constantly am amazed, actually, constantly amazed. Yeah. Well, it is amazing, but it's, 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 it's the, the fact that this creative creativity is happening with so many different dimensions of human potential all at the same time. It's very elegant. It's, it's fabulous. How's your zoo doing? A zoo? <laughs> Well, it's doing pretty good, actually. Yeah, very good. Yeah. yeah, they're just coming out of the winter, you know. So they, we we cover all the all the zoo in plastic in the winter, but uh, we're about to take it off. Yeah, yeah. How, and how are all the inmates doing? They're they're still sick. They're still singing, so we can hope that everything's fine. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that made quite an impression on me. Weren't you guys going to move to another place? Yeah, we're moving to Spain. Yeah, yeah, that's where we'll start the school probably. Yeah. When is that? When is that going to happen? Well, it's a bit unclear at the moment. 
Yeah, it's a bit unclear. Probably in about a year or two. I see. Mm -hmm. Well, it's fantastic. You, you all seem like, you, like you're doing fabulously well. It's so delightful to talk with everybody. Good. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Much love to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you.